Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. I'm here today with my friend David Butler, author of two of my favorite books, Plain and Precious Things, The Temple Religion of the Book of Mormon's Visionary Men, and The Goodness and the Mysteries, On the Path of the Book of Mormon's Visionary Men. David is also the author of numerous fiction books and is the 2018 Association of Mormon Letters Award winner for the best novel. In this bonus episode, we're going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount as a parallel to the endowment experience and take a deeper dive into 2 Nephi 9. For those of you who love to geek out and get into the depths, this episode is for you. If not, tune in next week after conference for a regular Talking Scripture on Come Follow Me. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike, and I'm really excited to be here with my friend Dave Butler. I met him online after reading a couple of his books, and then I just started peppering him with questions. And next thing I knew, we were <laughs> eating at a rib place, wasn't it? And yes, it was. <laughs> and so he's been gracious enough to to meet with us today. And for you people that love to geek out, this is your day, <laughs> right? Dave, tell us about yourself. Like, Where did you get your interest in Scripture and languages, and then where, where did that kick you off to? What really started me getting interested in the gospel, meaning, you know, uh, the intellectual study of the things of God, was uh, Hugh Nibley's book, Enoch the Prophet. And my parents were, they knew Hugh. I have met Hugh because he was in our ward. My dad was Hugh Nibley's bishop. And so he taught Sunday school. They'd show up to our ward who had nothing to do with our ward because they wanted to get in a free Hugh Nibley <laughs> lecture, right? So he was a guy I vaguely was aware of, and my parents started collecting those books when they came out, and I read Enoch the Prophet with basically zero, this is how I do everything in my life, with basically zero preparation, you know, just kind of jumped in off the deep end. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting. Like, there's, um, there's you know, something in here. Yeah, this is a thing that smart people can do. There is something in here. This is not a spiritual discipline for fools, there is meat. Yeah, he's wrestling with ideas that many of us have never even considered. Right. How did you think, okay, now I'm going to write a book about the Book of Mormon? Yeah. <laughs> Not only about the Book of Mormon, but what the Book of Mormon is saying, but that it isn't saying overtly. I mean, yeah. who, first of all, who thinks of that? And how did you get to that point? So I am a lawyer by training. That's my academic training. I don't practice law in an irrecognizable way now. But my first five years out of law school, I was working at a big firm in London and riding the train into work. I didn't want to live in London after a year, so we moved out in the countryside. So I was spending about four hours a day on a train. And so I read a ton. And I discovered the books of Margaret Barker. So to get to her, I had been reading a lot about the apocalyptic writings and the uh, deuterocanonical literature of the Second Temple. Now, for our listeners who aren't familiar with that term. Okay, for this purpose, apocalyptic is a trend that scholars would say sort of shows up near the end of the monarchy of Judah. There's a book by Paul Hansen, Paul D. Hansen, called Dawn of Apocalyptic, which is really a wonderful book, who basically places it in the followers of the original Isaiah, who he calls visionary men, which is interesting. And then it sh it's in the canon, it's, it's in the Bible, in books like Ezekiel and Daniel, and then in the New Testament, uh, like the book of Revelation. Very, is, it, is an apocalyptic is, text. Is what it's named after, yeah. They're revelations. They're not necessarily principally revelations of an end time, although that sometimes is the... I think that's how the Westerners read it. We like to read it as like a predictive text, right? We think of the apocalypse, the apocalypse as being the end of the world. Right. And that is one way for that genre to manifest. But, but also, another common aspect or manifestation of that genre is tours of the cosmos, Okay, uh, and especially Taking you on visions and levels of heaven, sending up the levels up to, of heaven to meet God. Right, exactly. And you see some of that in, for example, Daniel with the vision of the Ancient of Days on his throne. You see some of that in, in Revelation. You see it more clearly in books that are also apocalyptic, that are outside of the canon, outside of the like Bible. Like Enoch, right? 
First Enoch is a huge one. First Enoch 15 uh, is a very clear three-part ascent of Enoch up to heaven. And it's in three parts because it is modeled upon the three parts of the Temple of Jerusalem. So that in some sense, what is being communicated is, hey, here's this vision of Enoch the prophet. And in another sense, uh, what is being communicated is the temple's structure and furnishings. And that's an implicit part of the message. Uh, And then there's a whole bunch of apocalypse stuff that's in the apocryphal or deuterocanonical works, books that are, broadly speaking, that are like Bible books, but not in the Bible. Yeah, they didn't make the cut. I I like to say extra biblical literature, stuff that's not in the Bible, it's kind of extra stuff. Yeah. And I like section 91 where Joseph asks the Lord, is this okay? And should I translate it? And the Lord says, it's okay, don't translate it, but there's good stuff in there. Yeah. And so you sort it out, you the member, right? Yeah. Section 91 is wonderful because it tells us that, that everything is our canon. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. If it's, so, if it's true, dig it up. Yeah, go yeah. for it, which I think is, is amazing. So all of this have been kind of fermenting in my head for a while. And she's talking about this Jewish apostasy, this big shift in the religion of Israel right around the 700, 650 BC, right before Nephi, right? Yeah. This big shift in theology and what they do in the temple and... So all of this literature, the extra-biblical books and the study of them, one of the real recurring themes is that we think of there being a religion of ancient Israel, and there were clearly religions. There were different points of view. And the Old Testament very clearly is associated with a point of view. And it is a point of view that in some sense, one, because in the reign of King Josiah, it went around and killed everybody else and smashed up their stuff and burned their things. You know, William Deaver, I like his term where he says that the Old Testament is a minority report. Yes. It's a text written by the people that won. They right. won that the battle of the views, as it were, right? Is that a good right. description? It is. This is all implicit in sort of the biblical scholarship of the last 200 years. But in the last sort of 30 to 50 years, it's become really much more common for scholars to say, listen, to understand what's happening in Israel, you can't just read with the grain what the writer's saying. You have to realize that the writer is reacting against things. So you have to read against the grain, too. And so if there are lots of condemnations, for example, and this is tangentially related to what we'll talk about today, if there are lots of condemnations of a goddess named Asherah, what that means is that some people really must have been attached to her. Or, otherwise, why would they be talking otherwise, about Otherwise, why would it be worth anybody's mention, right? Yeah. They must have taken her seriously. Nobody in our pulpit today is condemning the flying spaghetti monster because it's a joke. Yeah, right. It's not a real thing. <laughs> Correct. So the Bible has more than one point of view, but it's got an editorial point of view that tries to wrap up everything and conceal the other points of view within it. So it's it's not obvious that we're seeing a library, which is, of course, what the name means, yeah. as opposed to, uh, y- you know, one point of view. As, as a footnote, one of my favorite titles is a Israeli scholar named Tzioni Tzavit, who's written a book called The Religions of Ancient Israel, A Synthesis of Parallactic Approaches. My, my, one it's of a my great favorite. title, yeah. Yeah, the yeah, like, title will kill you with its weight. But uh, his point is that there's lots of points of view, right? Yeah, and actually, and his, his very specific point is that for a long time, you've had people reading the text of the Bible and sort of taking it seriously as it is, and this is what happened, and people doing archaeology and going, nope, the text is yeah. is not right, does not match the archaeology, and they weren't talking to each other. So you're reading this stuff on the train. It's a lot of time. And by the way, all during this time, I'm also sort of running, I'm, I'm my Italian is pretty good. Most of the rest of my languages are pretty bad, but I have a lot of them. And this is why. It's because I would go in and I would have a Middle Egyptian grammar, and I would read that on the way in. And on the way back, I would do a little By the Syriac way, I think you were the one. I was in one of your books one day. I had my nose in it. And to me, it was just the most amazing connection that the word for rod oh, yeah. and the word for word yeah. is the same Egyptian yeah. word. And I was like... Nephi is punning on yeah. every level. Like you start going yeah, down this yeah. road, right? A hundred percent. There are Egyptian puns in there. 
produced by a, an 1829 farm boy, which they, lots of farm boys did at the time. This is yeah, how they... 20, 22 years old. They'd make they'd make puns <laughs> in dead languages. Yeah, Because uh, who, who doesn't? Because they didn't have television. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They were an oral <laughs> culture. So I've been doing this for, for, I mean, law school and then the five years there and then I, a year in New York and I moved to Idaho. So I've been doing this, reading this like this for like eight years. And the elders quorum presidency came to give me a calling. And I said, okay, well, I know you just reorganized the presidency, so it's, it's got to be elders quorum teacher, right? And they said, they said, yes, would you do it? And I said, okay, listen, here's the deal. I don't know why I felt entitled to say this, but this is what I said. I said, uh, you will never have to remind me, and you will not have to get a substitute, and I will show up every time, and I will do a great job. I will be prepared. I said, and I will not teach out of the manuals. And uh, they said, let us go think about this. They went and, to and, and told Steve Jones, who was the newly called Ellers Quorum president. He talked to his dad and his dad said, you know, why not? Jo Joseph did a school of the prophets and let's see what happens. You know, yeah. Well, it's the worst that could happen is, is probably basically his advice. So I embarked on trying to teach them every everything that I thought people should know about the Book of Mormon that we didn't ever talk about or notice. And that was the beginning of these ideas of putting this in a book is probably as you're teaching, you're getting inspiration. You're making connections even while you're talking. Oh, and, and so is the audience. So very quickly, it wasn't the first lesson I taught. I think the first lesson I taught might have been on the oracular use of the Urim and Thummim in the Book of Mormon. There's a couple passages in Alma where Urim and Thummim is not mentioned, but the textual pattern that is in the Old Testament for when the Urim and Thummim is used is clearly there. Military or civil leader goes to consult with a priestly leader who is known for having a gift of prophecy about a matter of the fate of the nation, including especially military matters. The priestly leader probably withdraws into a sacred space. There's the technical vocabulary, Sha'al by Yahweh, and to uh, ask, inquire the Lord. That's what the Book of Mormon language is, inquire of the Lord. And then you come back with specific tactical advice. Go over there and, and get them on the other side of the river, side in Lehi. So I think that was my first one. But I quickly got into this idea that had been kind of knocking around in my head for a while. I was convinced that uh, First Nephi 8 was an apocalyptic vision, was a vision not of the end of the world, but of the, of the uh, structure of the cosmos. And that like First Enoch 15, that it was a three-part ascent. ascent. The way that ascent looks is you start with a great and spacious field, and then you enter into a, the sort of meat of the vision where there is a great and spacious building. Uh, or the field is not as great and spacious, it's as wide as the world, right? As wide as it was the world. Then it's the great and spacious building above the earth with mists of darkness. And then holding on to an iron rod, and provocatively, there are four appearances of verbs for hold or grasp, where you grasp the iron rod apparently four times in First Nephi 8. And then you pass through the straight and narrow path into the presence of the tree of life. And I, and I was convinced... And as Westerners, I think we miss all of this. Y yes. It's just completely lost to us. We have this art tradition that completely leads us the wrong way. We, well, the, the rod becomes a railing. Yes. Instead of the scepter of the king. Instead of the scepter of the king, exactly. Yeah. Instead of a person. Yeah. Uh, and the railing is just not the same thing. Right. Despite the fact that Nephi tells us that the word of God is, is Jesus. Yeah, it is not a railing. It is the, it's the scepter of, of the king. And, and, and he leads you into the presence of the tree of life. And by the way, First Nephi 8.30, as people are entering the presence, they fall down, which suggests proskinesis. It suggests they're worshiping the tree. It's a multivalent symbol. It has to be. It has to be. Uh, yes. And so we are in the space there of the world tree, the world axis, the goddess of life, Asherah. We are in the space of, man, there's like er everything I say is like a whole other hour long conversation yeah. we have. Well, like Revelation 22, it ends with the tree and the throne and the river and the tree heals and the Bible begins and ends with a tree. So the tree clearly means something. And the tree is the tree is charity because the tree is the love of God and the greatest of his gifts. And charity is the greatest of the spiritual gifts. So like it's, it's all this stuff. The early Christians tied it to the cross of Jesus. The cross of Jesus is the tree of life. Who is, he's born under a tree and he dies under a tree. And by the way, our Christmas tree is the same thing. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's like it's like the story for Gentiles. It, yes. You know, even if you're secular, you've got a Christmas tree. So it's in your house. Absolutely. Yeah. So I just, I taught this kind of crazy free range Book of Mormon class 
for like five, six years. In Eagle, Idaho. In Eagle, and Idaho. this was the impetus to get these ideas going. Yep. And so then I, I'm guessing you just started putting stuff to paper. So to jump back over to like my Gentile career here, um, in 2010, my, the company where I was a corporate leader was acquired. I lost my job. And for about two years, I did whatever I wanted. We, we, we got a payout, right? So I could do whatever I wanted. We were not desperate for two years. And I said, oh, I'm going to write. So I started writing novels. But I also thought I should reduce to writing some of these things I've been teaching and thinking about. Oh, and, and let me give credit here because I, I was going to say this and then I got sidetracked. It is it is absolutely the case that while I'm preparing for lessons, I am I mean this word, but I'm, I'm, I'm inspired and also teaching and feeling inspired. But so are people who I'm teaching because I was actually reading through 1 Nephi 11 and it was Jay Calder who was in that elders quorum who pointed out as we were reading through it, speaking of the tree, First Nephi 13, I think, says, uh, you know, hey, the plain and precious things have been taken out of the biblical text the Gentiles are going to receive, right? First Nephi 11 says the tree is precious above all. So there's something going on there. Right. So, and, and he, and that wasn't a comment, like to me aside, we were, I was standing up in front of a projector and he said that, and I pretend that I had noticed it, right? So, oh yes, yes, correct. So, so it was a group, um, it was a group process, a group experience. And, uh, so I wrote those two short books to sort of capture what I was thinking at the time. I never looked at the vision that Lehi had before the, reading this, I never looked at it as a polemic or a, an attack yeah. against the corruptness of the priesthood in his day. Yeah. And then, and we're not going to flesh that out in this podcast. You, you the listener, just are going to have to read Plain and Precious Things. But <laughs> in that book, it is, to me, so clear. Yeah. That, and by the way, all religious texts do this. They they point out truth, but then they also say, but we're not this. And they're pointing to whatever the falsity is. So whether it's the sacred grove, Joseph walks out of the sacred grove and he knows something, yep. but he also knows what isn't true. And the Book of Mormon's doing this. I had never caught that before. And that connects with the idea that the Book of Mormon is minority religious literature. But what Barker is really good about, this is good, we're circling back so we don't miss points. What Barker is, what really distinguishes her from um, so many of the other writers about the extra biblical books is to ask the really important so what question. Right, which is okay, fine. Why does so this there matter? Are there are multiple points of view. Yeah, exactly. Why does this matter? Who cares? And who Why? cares? And and the really great, the really great, really fruitful question that she asks, which is, okay, so uh, if there are multiple religions of Israel, and and the one associated with certain of the kings and some reforming movements won politically and and tried to write the others out and force them underground, right? Which is what the Old Testament's doing. Well, yes, which is, that's not what you hear from the pulpit usually, but that's a fairly non controversial comment from the point of view of biblical studies. But with that background, what then is the mental furniture? What is happening inside the heads of the people who meet this guy, right? And he's not some mysterious figure who rode down out of the clouds. He's a carpenter's son from Nazareth, right? And they can point at his brothers and his sisters, and that's his mother. And yet, they see this guy, and, and apparently thousands of them are moved to say, this guy is Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Jesus is Lord. What are they thinking, right? And so, you know, her journey then kind of to grossly oversummarize it is an exploration that says, hey, one of the things that the reformers at the end of the history of the kingdom of Judah did not like was the religion of the kings of Judah, themselves. And the things that these reformers in Deuteronomy and in Kings condemn are things that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did, and are things that the kings of Judah did. And her, her argument is it was the heirs of that religion who were still waiting for the king who manifested himself as, the, as Yahweh come in person who saw Jesus and said, this is the guy we've been waiting for. It's like those two threads came together in Jesus. Yeah. The people with the expectation of that early religion, what I call first Israelite temple religion, yep. and the old belief system, which had never really died. It still yep. existed somewhere, whether orally or what have you. Yep. I think Margaret's contention is it was in this scripture that didn't make the canon, essentially. Right. Yep. 
uh, and probably also uh, orally, right, and in books we don't have even. Sad. That, yeah. that just makes me sad to think all about the stuff we just don't have. <laughs> that is really true. So, yeah. So at some point, uh, I sort of seeing what Margaret's question was, uh, was moved to write a parallel question. And I think I formulated the question in writing the first book rather than in the context of the classes. And that is, what must Nephi think? What well, must what's be, in his head? What's in his head? What is the mental furniture in Nephi's head that makes the Book of Mormon make sense? It's not that I'm saying what that makes it true. I, I believe in the Book of Mormon. I think it's. I think the criticisms of the Book of Mormon are ridiculous. But okay, granted that there's this book, right? What must he believe for this to make the most amount of sense? So uh, you, Mike, you sent me some potential prompts, and one of them was this uh, provocative question about code languages. Which is great because it reminded me of a quote from Brigham Young, uh, or not? It's not maybe not. It's a it's not a perfect quote. It's actually from Wilford Woodruff's diary in 1857. So he's writing down a sermon, right? So Wilford Woodruff's account of what Brigham Young said, and there's a very short quote where Brigham says, "I could preach all about the endowments in public, and the world would know nothing about it." And that's that's really interesting. Because that implies that one way the endowments function is as something that enables a secret language where you can communicate on two levels simultaneously. You could speak in public and people who, uh, who don't have the key will understand you on one level and people who do have the key will understand you on an entirely different level. Those that have eyes to see. This, and this is interesting, right, because commentators on the New Testament have long observed that the synoptic gospels frequently have this statement from Jesus, ho echon ota akueto, well, who, the ones who have ears, let them hear. And that that seems to mark esoteric secrets, that some people should be able to see in the text, aha, that Jesus is saying something that speaks to them because they hold the key, because they have ears. And in fact, that's really good because that's, that is actually in Matthew 13. Whoops, and I just opened to Helaman. We have too many scriptures. No, I'm just kidding. We don't have enough. We don't have enough. Give us more scriptures, Lord. So Matthew 13, I actually wanted to read verses 10 to 16. But actually, verse 9 says, in fact, who has ears to hear, let him hear. Exactly what we were just saying. There it is. So this idea of a code in the process of writing these books and thinking and, and just reading the scriptures all the time, I came across this passage. You know, in the scriptures, you read something a hundred times and you're just not ready. Or have you ever done this? I remember being on my mission and I yeah. would read something and I'm like, okay, they just repeated the same concept yeah. 15 times in the text. Yeah. They're not doing it because they don't know what to say. There's something here. And I'd been to the temple, but, you know, I'm a missionary, so right. I don't have any experience. Right. But I just remember just pondering some of these things and going, what's going on? And I think our listeners, too, a lot of times have read things. And I think that's why they seek, they go out to podcasts and they go out to study materials because we all have this hunger to, like, know more. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a huge group of saints that are like, okay, but I want more. Give me yeah, more, yeah, yeah. right? And I think that's probably what spurred you on to learn the language and spend some time. I mean, you didn't spend four hours on the train listening to Britney Spears. You were like, right. you're, you want to feed your soul, right? Right. Exactly anyway, right. And I think that's where our listeners are at. Yeah. The nature of an initiatic secret is that it's public. And the secret is not that no one says it. The secret is that you have to be ready to understand it. you got to get it. It's out there and it's in front of you all the time. And when you are ready, you will understand. And, and I think that, that many of our scriptures are written on that level. So let me read Matthew 13, 10 to 16 here. So, and the disciples came and said unto him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's an extremely provocative phrase, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore, I speak, therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of, of Isaiah, of Isaiah, this is from Isaiah 6, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. 
For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Now, there's a whole other conversation we have about Isaiah and Isaiah 6, but we won't. But I think that Paul Hansen is saying something very important, and when he's connecting visionary men and the roots of apocalyptic literature in the Israelite tradition with Isaiah and his first followers, because I think that Isaiah begins to write in a kind of code. So uh, Jesus here... A, he connects what he's doing with behavior that's, that goes back to Isaiah. That's a whole other conversation. Yeah, he's making this connection. Yeah, Jesus makes the this connection. This isn't random. Right. But he also says, hey, you, right, there's a you, a us, the disciples, and there's the them, right? You know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, and it, it was given to you. And by the way, it's connected with blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. So the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven are things that you see and that you hear. And because you have seen and heard these things, you understand the parables. That's the, right, this is the question we're answering. Why do you speak in parables? You have seen the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. You understand these, uh, to, but they do, they have not seen or heard. So they don't, they don't have a frame of reference. They're not going to yeah. get it. So it's harmless to them. It's meaningless to them. Right. And, uh, now mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So uh, let me just say right now, the kingdom of heaven means the temple and, and specifically the kingdom of heaven is the Holy of Holies. Okay. And there's layers to this, right? So it's the sacral kingship, the king and queen anointed in God's presence to represent God to the people. But and it's, it's the every of individual God. who ascends to sit and become a wise man and sit upon the rock on the throne of God and become a king. Men and women. Right. Yes, right? you are. And by the way, there is no king kings without a priests. woman, right? Right. Okay. So that's the kingdom of heaven. What are mysteries? Well, mysteries is a word we have largely forgotten how to understand. It came to mean theological conundrums stuff we can't like how many angels on ahead of a pin type thing how are the three how is it three in one one in three a triune god not confounding the substance not right whatever that is all right <laughs> mystery a mystery and, and then it came to mean just a conundrum right the murderers in the room morg who how well you know there's a orangutan killing people but originally tom Eusteria are rights a mustace was a celebrant of a ritual, someone who performed an ordinance. Um, is where the word mystic comes from. And the, myst the mysteries are ancient rituals. And this is the way that classicists, Walter Burkert or Jane Ellen Harrison or whatever, just classicists, they talk about mysteries, the mysteries of Eleusis, the mysteries of Demeter. They're talking about rituals that are, that are sacred, that are private, that are dramatic in nature, meaning people act out roles, uh, that are mythological. They have a story, people performing the story of the kidnapping of Persephone, right? Or the story of Orestes coming back to, you know, get revenge for his murdered father. So that's what mysteries means. So when Jesus talks about the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, and, and the, the Greek is tam mysteria, right? This is not an artifact of the King James translation. It is the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. We should take seriously the possibility that what he's saying is, listen, I am saying stuff that is gibberish to the crowd, but you will get it you disciples, because you have participated in, you have seen and heard the mysteries of the of the Holy of Holies, of the kingdom of heaven. And, and I think through the apostasy and through culture, we've kind of lost some of these ideas that you're talking about. A hundred percent. And we don't know all the details of, for example, the measurements and the furnishings of the temple as they experienced it. So there are things that we have not seen where he's counting out numbers, this many seeds, that many seeds, that, you know, there are details that we have not seen that the apostles did that I think that if, if we had experienced the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven as Peter had, then I think what Matthew tells us is the parables will be clear to us. Okay. Now, but you're thinking, but Dave, what about the Book of Mormon? You're like talking about Matthew and Isaiah. Where, where are you going with this? Well, the word mysteries appears 20 times in the Book of Mormon. Verse 1. Is where, is where it starts. And it's not, this isn't random. This isn't by chance. Nephi's 
right out of the gate doing something, isn't he? That is correct. And he, a couple of times later, talks about why he's writing. And he says things like, for wise purposes. That, and that's interesting because the word wise, wisdom, appears in the Sermon on the Mount in the connection with the kingdom of heaven. He connects it with... Uh, Maybe even with temple service with some of the language he uses. But he's actually really clear in verse 1. I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents. This is the one verse we've all read, right? We get to the second Nephi and some of us drop out. But everyone's read this one. Yeah. <laughs> having been born of goodly parents, therefore I was taught somewhat in all the learning of my father. Right, All the learning of my father. Having seen many afflictions in the course of my days, nevertheless having been highly favored, we would say blessed, of the Lord in all my days, yea, having had a great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God, therefore I make a record of my proceedings in my days. Why am I making a record? This is the point of this paragraph. He's explaining himself. Why am I making a record? Because I have had a great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God. And then he starts off with a vision of ascent. And the first right thing we get, in fact, in fact, is is we get two visions of ascent before we're even out of the first chapter. You know, let's, let's go there. We talk about that. So <laughs> yeah. we, we, we can do whatever we want. Whatever we want. I can come back another day if, <laughs> we, need to go, if we need right. more time. And I will not be mad about that. Awesome. So. He records his father, Lehi, who's out traveling. Verse six, as he, Lehi, prayed unto the Lord, there came a pillar of fire and dwelt upon a rock before him. And he saw and heard much caused him to, to quake and to tremble. That's the first vision of the Book of Mormon, okay? A pillar of fire upon a rock. Now, that's really interesting because there is a rock, right? We're talking about temple things. There is a rock in the temple, and it is actually all over the place in the Book of Mormon and in the Bible, but it's, it's never named explicitly when the Bible gives prose accounts of what's in the temple. You know, here's the, here are the tables, here's the candlestick. The rock is never mentioned, but it shows up in all the poetry and the prophecy. And this rock is so important, it is so grand and huge that it has its own Wikipedia page, and it's, it's called the Foundation Stone. And there's pictures in there. There's pictures. Go look on Wikipedia. The Foundation Stone, the Eben Shatia is the, is the Hebrew. The underneath it reminds me of Indiana Jones. And, and it's so <laughs> important that Indiana Jones ripped it off. That's yeah. correct. Okay. Because, because there's a cave underneath that may once have had water. There's, there's a lot of like poetic, prophetic reasons to think maybe it had water in it. Because this is a Muslim holy site, no one's in there doing archaeological uh, examinations right now. I asked if I could go look at it. Yeah. But and they, they wouldn't said, let no, you. you're not coming in. And by the way, interesting stuff has happened in that part of the world right now. So maybe things will change. Well, maybe one day. So, yes, but the Well of Souls is the name of the cave under the Eben Shatia. Such a cool name. Yeah, which is a very cool name. And so Raiders of the Lost Ark steals it and makes it in the little place where Indy goes with his little, you know, gets his, the beam that goes through the ruby head of the staff. And if I, I ever get a man cave in my house, yeah, I'm going to call well it the Well of the Souls. <laughs> the cool Well of Souls. <laughs> Enter. <laughs> Build a model of Karnak under on the floor. <laughs> yeah, there's a rock. And by the way, the fiery, the throne of God... The Ark, the Ark of Covenant, sits on the, the Well of Souls. And in fact, in the Jewish literature, the Mishnah, which are the Jewish, they're collected uh, like in the early 2nd century AD. So they're being collected about the same time that the New Testament is kind of being put together. And they record sort of, uh, hey, how, how are we doing things, we Jews in Palestine? How do we do stuff? Given that we don't have all of the trappings to be able to do what the book of Exodus and the book of Deuteronomy tell us to do in Leviticus. How do we do our religion? How do we do our religion? And there's a, uh, it's divided into tractates. Think of those as like books. And one of those tractates is called uh, Yoma, Tractate Yoma. Yoma is, is Aramaic for day. It means day of atonement. So this is a, a book in the Mishnah. And you can get a Hebrew. An English translation has been available for a long time. Danby is the name of the translator. You can get like a one volume English translation. Tractate Yoma talks about this rock and it says, uh, look, once we lost the Ark of the Covenant, we start treating the rock uh, as if it were the Ark. And so specifically in the Day of Atonement, if you read in, in Leviticus, there are uh, there's a sequence of blood that needs to be scattered on the Ark to clean, to atone. And in Jesus' time, this is being done on the boulder because the Ark was gone. So there's a boulder. What sits on it is the Ark. The ark is a, 
It's a box. It holds stuff, but it's also a chariot, and it's also God's throne. And especially in visions, we see things like the Ancient of Days sitting on a throne. This is a vision of the Holy of Holies and the throne throne of God. And Daniel sees the throne, and it is fiery. And Enoch sees the throne, and it is fiery. And as is First Enoch, not Book of Moses, First Enoch, super common available book. And rivers of fire come out of it, right? So a fire on a rock is not a random image. The fire on a rock is the flaming throne of God. And right out of the gate of the yeah. Book of Mormon, here it is. Verse 6. And in Helaman 5, same stuff, Helaman right? Helaman 5 is the same stuff. Now, you go, okay, well, Dave, that's an interesting hypothesis. Yeah, okay. But let me tell you something else. One of the recurring patterns, literary patterns you see in the apocalyptic literature is paired visions. And the visions explain each other. Like First Nephi 8 and 11. Yes, right? like First Nephi 8 and First Nephi 11 to 14. Um, but it actually happens here first, because the first vision is a fire on a rock. Then Lehi goes home and falls upon his bed and has another vision. And what is it? It is the throne of God. It breaks it down. Yeah. They're the same vision. It's, it's the same vision repeated twice. It, it is a vision that starts in the kingdom of heaven at the throne of God, the place where God is king. So I think we should take seriously the possibility that Nephi means what he says when he says, listen, I knew the mysteries of God. I, I have great knowledge. And, and, and although the story starts when he's a young man, right? He's not writing. He's not he's writing as a yeah, young man. No. He is a fully experienced priestly leader, apparently a king, although he's shy to say that of himself, but doing what he can for his people. And they name his successors Nephi 2 and Nephi 3. That's all king. Sounds like he's a king, yeah. right? So he's the, he's the king and their high priest, and he's having this special record made. I, great knowledge of the goodness of mysteries of God. Now, a hypothesis. I don't feel like this is a hypothesis anymore. I mean, it's my belief. Let me tell you what I think, and then we'll maybe talk through kind of a key, and, and I'll show you an example. I think the Book of Mormon is written to be read by people who know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. I think the same way that Brigham Young says, oh, I could talk about the endowment all day, and if you and you wouldn't in the world, right, you Gentiles wouldn't even know it. I think the Book of Mormon is that kind of text. I can talk about and do talk about the temple things, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven all day, and most of you are going to read it, and you're not even going to see it. Because your eyes have not seen and your ears have not heard. So I like to look at the Book of Mormon that way and also as the invitation. So there's the zones of holiness, right? Moses is this first priest that brings him out of the world to draw him out of the water and bring him yeah. in. Back to the rod imagery. Yeah. If my investigator, let's say I'm in the middle of Zimbabwe and I'm teaching somebody who's never heard of this and they read the Book of Mormon, the second they pick it up and start reading it in faith, yep. they're touching the scepter. So there, there's this connection, this conduit between them and heaven. And if they just keep going, they'll get to the mysteries, right? It's, it's almost the idea of, yes, it's to those who have been initiated in the mysteries, but yet the Book of Mormon is so simple. Yeah. A young child could read it and feel the spirit and feel God in it. So it's, it's like it covers everything, right? It's the like Alpha and Omega of sacred texts. And is being instructed in reading the Book of Mormon without realizing it about the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven is being given layer upon layer of instruction so that one day they'll come back and go, oh. There it is. Yeah. And I love, aha, I love that you said faith. I think that the three-part ascent that we see, the, the ascents over time, the ascents that show up in apocalyptic literature, they start simple. Three levels. Or maybe sometimes early ones have seven, where you're talking about like the seven visible planets. Right? Enoch's doing some of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The further away you get from the source, the more Baroque you get. And you get like, does the hundred levels and the 99 levels and right. <laughs> but but at the beginning, it's it's pretty straightforward. And, and it's very, very commonly three. And, and for the Book of Mormon, it's basically three. Uh, and for Matthew, it's three. And I believe that the three spiritual gifts, faith, hope, and charity, correlate with a three-part ascent. They describe part of the change that we undergo and the things we must do to make that ascent ourselves. And so I think it's exactly right that you say, grabs the scepter in faith. Faith is the motive power. Faith is is the gift that God gives you that says, okay, we're going to start this journey by making some promises, and I will promise you that you can do it. I'll get you there. I'll get you there. 
and it looks hard. It looks like moving mountains. It looks like it looks like you'd have to say a word to make a mountain move from here to there. You can do it, mm -hmm. right? That's that's the power of faith. And then hope is the belief that you can be admitted. That it comes as you're part way along the journey, and then the love of God is the is the grace that is given to you as you arrive. I like to look at charity as I'm seeing people as God sees them. Yeah. So the beams out of my eye, I'm judging the oh, right yeah. way. I'm seeing things the right way. That's really interesting. I'm seeing things the way he sees them. Charity. Oh, I love that. So let me talk about a key. This is a little bit counterintuitive. So let me tell you my hypothesis. And my hypothesis was arrived at a little bit. Science is very muddy. You don't like, you don't, you don't, you're like, observe some facts. You change your idea. You think about it. You observe some other facts. But here's what I think. I think that the... Sermon on the Mount records an ordinance. I think actually what it records is the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven that Matthew has Jesus talking about. We're talking about the temple. Seven chapters later. And it records it in uh, surprisingly great detail. I think uh, this is sort of the counterintuitive part. Even though we think of the sermon as being something that Jesus said, I think it is clearly something that pre-existed his mortal life, something that he was taught as, as a man. Somebody came to him and, and did this with him. And the reason I think that is because it's all over the place in the Book of Mormon, which means the Nephites had it, okay? And maybe they had it because God gave it to them, because I believe in Revelation. I think it's likely, very likely, is part of what Lehi took, part of the inheritance, this, the knowledge, uh, uh, the learning of my father. Yeah that Nephi is talking about, right? I think uh, the, the Josephite tradition coming down out of Egypt, maybe. And by the way, after reading your books, you don't, I don't read the second half of Genesis the same. Yeah. It's ascension. Joseph's getting a new name and he's getting married and he's prophesied yeah. seed and he gets yeah. a ring and a signet and a robe. And I'm like, yeah, yep. Joseph's talking about this stuff. It's there. And it's he's brought to meet his family again and recognize them. And it ends in an embrace. Yep. It's like kind of coded, but it's there. It's all there. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that learning to see the Sermon on the Mount as an ordinance is a, it's a switch. Once what I, what do you mean by switch? Like something in you switched? Yeah, I mean it's it's binary. Like there's a world before you see it, and there's a world after you see it, and it's not the same. And then you start seeing it all over the place in Genesis, uh, in Hebrews, all over the place. So I think this is maybe it's half. Think of this as like half of a really important key. And the other half is your own experience. Uh, this, is, this is not my discovery, by the way. Jack Welch is very famous for discovering chiasmus in the Book of Mormon. He should be more famous for publishing the argument that the Sermon on the Mount is an ordinance, because it's, I think, much farther reaching. In most cases, chiasmus is interesting. It adds a little information. Alma 36 is maybe the great example where it adds a lot of information. Most of the time you go, oh, a little parallel, cool. It's a little interesting. I think it's thing. one of those things like no 22 year old is going to be able to do that. Yes. Alma 36 is the showcase for that, right? right? Like, no, like, again, the arguments that Joseph is just silly. So, Jack's book is called The Sermon on the Temple and the Sermon on the Mount. It was out of print for a while. I think it might be back in print now. See, see if you can find this book. You haven't got it. Here's the thing two things about the way Jack talks about it. One, I think he, he wants to be very careful not to be always clear about what he's saying because I think he's just being very careful not to cast pearls before swine. I, he's, he's more oblique than I will be. I'm going to be very no, yeah. non-oblique. I'm be very direct. The other thing that I think he tends to do is I think he tends to kind of want to say, hey, here in the Sermon on the Mount is something that is just like an endowment experience. I think you can over... I think you can push that too far, which is to say, I think if you are assuming that it's just like your endowment experience, you're going to miss where it's different. So I think your two halves of a key or your two keys are, hey, the Sermon on the Mount is the record I have of this mysteries of the kingdom of heaven as people in the time of Jesus. And I'm going to make this argument today here. Jacob, uh, brother of Nephi, right? knew this ordinance and we don't have a we have a surprisingly detailed but of course not complete record right and then i have my own experience which is just surprisingly parallel lots and lots of similarities not always exactly the same so i would want to not force the one to be the other 
we can have whole other conversations to, uh, to say, well, why are they different? You know, are they different? Well, like why, why are Matthew and Third Nephi different, right? Are they different because different dispensations, because of translation issues, because of different cultures? Have we been given more light? Are we missing light, right? That's interesting conversations. But I think you'll get further if you just hold those two pieces. Say, hey, I've got my experience. This is interesting. And, uh, and the Sermon on the Mount, okay? Now, what I want to do is I want to walk through Matthew, and I want to show you what I mean when I say the Sermon on the Mount is, or, is an ordinance. And that, again, you should say, okay, the lion's share of the, the, the credit here, all the credit goes to Jack Welch. So if you see Jack Welch, say, Dave Butler thinks this should be what you're famous for. This is amazing. That's what you should say to Jack when you see him. I'm going to say some things that did not come from Jack that are my observations. So if you think that anything I say is idiotic, it's probably my part. Okay. Now I've got in front of me the King James and uh, I'm going to, I've also got my Greek New Testament, which I may pull open if I want to remind myself of the words here. By the way, it's interesting. Martin Luther hated the Sermon on the Mount. He thought it was fraudulent. He thought the devil inserted this. There's a Leonard Cohen line, actually, the, the staggering account of the Sermon on the Mount, which I don't pretend to understand at all. And so for a long time, uh, scholars have said, it's not a sermon. It's a collection of wise sayings. And they've looked for the sources and said, oh, something like the Gospel of Thomas, which isn't a history. It's like just a collection of nomic, meaning like uh, aphoristic proverbs type sayings. And that just got assembled here. But I think you're going to see there's a better explanation. All right. So Matthew uh, 5 1. Oh, because first of all, it's got three chapters, right? And uh, let me just remind you that the the temple, as described in the Chronicles and Kings, and also, well, sort of, also in Exodus, the tabernacle, is a three-part space. There's a space out front, and then there's the middle space, and then there's the Holy of Holies. Okay, And so the hypothesis is this is a three-part ordinance that happens in space and that these chapters correspond to things you would do. And if we read it this room. way, it will make more sense. Yes, I think is what I'm hearing you say. Yes. And there will come a day when I would like to take a class and like just walk through a three-part space and read it together so you could see it. Because I, I think actually moving and encountering some of the actors who seem implied by the text would really make this vivid. But again, also remember your experience because some of it's going to be very relevant. So the first verse, and seeing the multitudes, he, we assume Jesus, went up into a mountain and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Now, so Jesus is sitting, he's on a mountain. This is the ordinance by which people approach the one who sits on the mountain. Now, one, now, who sits on the mountain? Well, the temple is the mountain of God, and who sits on it is God upon his throne, right? But it actually gets better than that because in Hebrew, the verb to sit is yashav, which also means to dwell. So this is the ordinance in three parts by which a, one approaches the person who sits slash dwells upon the mountain, which can only be God. Right. This is the ordinance by which one approaches God. This, this is where we're headed. Yeah. Jesus is like, I, let me show you how to get to Father's house. Right. Which, by the way, we get to the end and it says, and they were astonished. He did not teach like the Pharisees. That's why. Okay. So he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying. Now these are really interesting. I think Jack talks about these beatitudes as being entrance qualifications. I think that's fine. That's an excellent way to think about them. There's more. First of all, let me just point out that there are nine. There are nine blessed statements. There are seven blessings. Let me read them. Blessed are the poor in, heaven, in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Whoa, okay, kingdom of heaven. Here we go. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. All right. So there are, there are, there are nine uh, blesseds. That's going to come back. Okay, just remember that. Um, there are seven blessings, and, and those specific blessings will come back. Now let me just talk about the whole formula. So 
Oh, of course, we're reading this in English, and this is a translation uh, of Greek. But Jesus is probably not using either of those languages, right? He is speaking in Aramaic, or he is speaking in Hebrew. This is just an, this is a tangential note, but it touches on things we've already said, so I have to say it. The so-called beatitude formula, blessed are, appears in the Old Testament. Proverbs 3 is, an, is a great example. Okay, Proverbs 3, I want to say verses 13 to 17. And what it's translating... Translations will say, blessed is he who, or uh, happy is he who. And in Proverbs 3, it's happy is the man who finds wisdom. And it's about following a path and taking hold of wisdom, which is a tree of life unto him. So this is definitely in the space we're talking about. Coming to a tree. Coming to a tree. Yeah. Which should always, should all, this is like the great secret marker. Like when you see a journey that ends in a tree, just, just, just look at it. So in respect of that passage in particular, Proverbs 3, scholars have said, hey, there's probably a pun on the name Asherah here, because Asherah is a tree. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom. He'll take hold of it. It'll it'll be a tree of life unto him. Well, what is the formula in Hebrew? The formula is Ashrei, the man who whatever. Ashrei actually is, it means the happiness of, okay? It is a so-called construct form, if you are keeping grammatical score. The happiness of the man who finds wisdom, right, is literally what it's saying. We translate as uh, happy is the one who finds wisdom, blessed is the one who finds wisdom. We call it beatitudes because in Latin they translated this as beati. Beati are the ones who do whatever. Well, ashre sounds an awful lot like ashera. The difference is between an H on the end or a he and a, and a yod. It's really a difference in vowel sounds, ashre, ashra. Super close. It's super close. And because a Y on the end of a word, a yod on the end can mean someone from a place or something belonging to something, ashre looks like, it looks like maybe the one who be- belongs to ashra, of ashra. And so... It reminds me of when Nephi describes the tree. Yeah. And he said, whose fruit was to make one happy. Yeah. Oh. Which is, that's the word, right? Happiness appears three times in the Old Testament. Uh, zero in the New Testament and 26 times in the Book of Mormon. Okay. The Book of Mormon is the book of happiness. Yeah. Uh, but there's a pun there. There's, there's something a happening. Pun there. Yeah. In the words of uh, that famous movie from Spielberg, yeah. this means something. This means something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in front of a big mountain of potatoes, but I know it means something. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an interesting point here in Matthew 5. Is it possible that at the beginning of this journey, we are saying, hey, the the poor in spirit, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, the meek, they belong to Asherah. Asherah, the one who hungers and thirsts after righteousness. Asherah of the peacemakers. If Jesus is speaking Hebrew, that's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. Which then is, they translate to Makarios, right. which is just the blessed state of the gods. But and either way, it's cool. In Latin. Yeah. yeah. So, look, I'm jumping ahead, but uh, we're going to find that Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are a journey to a tree. By the way, that's probably new to a lot of people, that idea. Yes. So I I just want to repeat that again. We're heading in this vision to a tree. Yeah. We're heading, and that is super important. So look, um, I will probably skip some verses here. That does not mean I don't think they're relevant. It may mean I don't know what they mean or that I just am trying to highlight Verse 13 is really interesting. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Now, we're at the beginning of this journey, and we're said, hey, you know, if you have all these characteristics, you can belong to Asherah. That's the journey. And there's this list of seven blessings, and we're approaching God on his throne. And then there's this really interesting warning that says, if you lose your savor, you shall be cast out and trodden under foot of men, which I think in context can only be a, a threatened covenant penalty. Which, by the way, it then makes Alma chapter 30 super, super interesting. Because Alma 30 is Korahor. And I grew up hearing priesthood lessons and and, and gospel doctrine lessons. We were very worried about intellectuals when I was a young man. He's an intellectual. It can really go wrong. I I actually think there's there's a lot of evidence in Alma 30 that Korahor is a covenant priest who has failed to keep his covenants, including... How does Korahor die? He is cast out, and he is trodden underfoot of men. Literally. He's a, he's a rogue, like an apostate, yeah. right? He is an apostate, and he is killed by the covenant penalty. 
So, uh, you know, that's a totally different spin, but it's right there. It's right there. Uh, again, this is, you see this and you can't unsee it. I like that connection with Korahor. Uh, yes. 14 and 15. Ye are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine. So we're journeying to, to be in a city on top of the hill. There's something else interesting here, though. Matthew and Alma both say, I think it's Matthew 10 and, and maybe Alma 5, both have the phrase that the righteous shine in the kingdom of God. Remember, this is blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, right? These are the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, the righteous shine in the kingdom of God. And where that phrase appears in Matthew, it's followed by who has ears to hear, let him hear, suggesting that it's an esoteric secret. This is about shining. Now that's a really old and super interesting idea because our word divine which is also the source of like the French Dieu and Italian Dio, but also like the name Jupiter is Dios Pitar, Dios. It's also, when we talk about Hollywood divas, that's where this word comes from. It's a very old word and it means to shine. The uh, Indo-European, right? The gods are the shining ones. So this is an ordinance about approaching God on his throne and becoming one of the shining ones about becoming one of the righteous who shine in the kingdom of God. Do you see a connection in the Book of Mormon anywhere? Would this be a Benedi when he's in front of Noah? I absolutely think that's right. I think Helaman 5. Or, Helaman I mean, 5, they're shining. shining. Yeah. Now, ver, uh, verses 17 through 19 uh, through 20. I'm just going to lump those together and comment on them. If you, if you read them, he's talking about the law of Moses. I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Now... If we take seriously the idea that this is an ordinance, there have to be other people than you, the individual who's experiencing it, right? Even in something as simple as a baptism, there's somebody who is baptizing you. But if there's an ordinance that is so complex that it takes six pages to describe skeletally, there's probably more than that. And again, the idea of mysteries, these are, they're not just ritual actions, they're stories that are lived, they're mythologies, the mysteries of, of Eleus, Eleusis or the mysteries of Demeter. Uh, I think there's a suggestion here that in the first room of this ordinance, there is a person who is conducting you and that person is doing so in the guise of Moses. Kind of representing him. Kind of representing him. And and all the things that you have been taught and understood about Moses, you are experiencing them as you are in this first room. There is a sequence of priests. There are many places. There are sequences of three-part sequences of priests. But in Matthew 17, the uh, Mount of uh, Transfiguration, that sequence appears, and, and it is Moses, Elijah, and then the Lord. And, and they're on top of a mountain, and Peter says, Can, shall we make three skenai, three, three tents? And that's puzzled people for so long. Yeah. And I think, I think we're actually seeing in that chapter a, another way to think about this experience and what's going on. Again, people are shining, and there are three tents or three rooms in a temple. It is on top of a mountain. And the three dwellers in these three tent rooms are Moses, Elijah, the Lord. And in Micah chapter was a four, that same sequence appears, right? Moses, remember Moses before, the, and I will send you Elijah, and then the great terrible day of the Lord, Moses, Elijah, the Lord. I think we'll see a few reasons to think that that's the sequence of priests that's implied by this ordinance, or at least at, at, at some point in time, those were the names and the ideas. Uh, and they're doing different things. Like Moses is pulling us out of Egypt. Yep. And Elias is saying, make straight the way, prepare to see the Lord. And then from my reading, the Lord's saying, let me introduce you to the Father. Yeah. I mean, do you, I mean, do you see some of those things there? Uh, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Well, I think... Elias or Elijah is the priest of the second room. You think about the stories of Elijah, and there's a, a guy who lives in a tent and comes forward, and he's giving the king warning, right? And I think in if we think about that as sort of mythology or a really broad expression of what the Elias priest is all about, the king there is you and me. The king there is is every sinner who is trying to approach God on the mountain. And the Elias, the Elias priest is the one who's saying, you're not ready. You're not ready. You need to do these things. Here's how you do this. That's a great way to read scripture. Yeah. And by the way, this changes how we read the Book of Mormon. 
Uh, just yes. a little bit. Yes, just just a lot. So Moses shows up. Now we're going to see other actors in just a moment. But before uh, we we start having these interesting teachings, okay? There's uh, verses 21 and 22. Hey, you have heard that it was said by them of old time that thou shalt not kill. Whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Uh, now, this is interesting. 23 and 24. Leave, therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Okay, so this is an ordinance, and there is an altar. People are being invited to come forward, but you can only have good feelings towards other people if you want to participate. You need to go get reconciled with your brother. You can't even call him a fool, right? You can't be here if you got those issues. You're not allowed to be at the altar. So we should imagine people, you know, uh, with some kind of action around an altar. Now, verse 25 and 26 are really interesting. So I said, I think that some, there's a sequence of three priests. There's actually a sequence of four. Here's priest 1B. Okay, verse 25, agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence until thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Now, adversary, other Christians remember the meaning of this word. I think we LDS have sort of forgotten, but the underlying Greek here is the anti-dikos, and dikos uh, is justice or a lawsuit. And anti is the guy opposite you in the lawsuit. Like the prosecutor. Like the prosecutor or the plaintiff. Or in Hebrew, I think he was like the Satan. He was the Satan. That is correct. This is what Satan means. Satan is the guy who comes after. He's your accuser. He stands against you in the lawsuit. That's who you're being warned against. So if we are reading a complex liturgy, what we have here is presumably a priest in some sort of clothing to indicate to you that he is Satan. He's, he's, the, a, he's the accuser. He's got a different robe. He's the accuser. Maybe if they want to frighten you, he's got like, you know, a monster head or something. I don't know. He shows up and you're given a warning about him, right? And by the way, it's not Satan's power. It's not actually Satan's power you need to fear. What you can't do is be in debt to Satan. Because being in debt to Satan means you end up uh, that the officer and the judge have to go make you pay your fine. Right. So again, if it's a liturgy, Satan shows up, your Satan, your accuser, there's this warning. Then he appears to uh, drop out. We don't see him specifically, at least as far as I can tell in the text. Now, uh, so we've had all this, all this kind of some warnings, some, a little drama. Now we get a, our first moral teaching and it starts in verse seven. You've heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. And I will, you know, jump all the way down to Verse 32, and you can, you can just read that. It's moral teaching on uh, adultery, moral teaching on chastity, moral teaching on commitment, okay? We might call it the law of chastity. Yeah. And, you know, Jesus is actually calling people to a higher standard. You, you were told, X, actually, here's the deal. It's, it's more than that. This is, it's interesting. This is the first moral teaching that we've really seen. But then we get this, verse 33. Again, ye have heard that hath been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither canst thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. By the way, footnote. The oath the Jaredites swear in Ether 8 is, is the oath that is forbidden in Matthew 5. So this is really old stuff. Yes. Those guys are a long time ago. Yes. And the Gadian robbers, the secret combinations, are not a random enemy. They're like the intimate enemy. They're the specific enemy of the Nephite prophets, right? We know who you are. You are the counterfeit of us. You are, you're the one our fathers warned us against. So, but don't, don't swear these oaths, but let your communications be yay, yay, nay, nay. All right. Now, if we are, if we are reading a complex piece of liturgy, we've just been given a commitment to live a law of chastity. And now we have just been told what? This is how you answer it. You don't need to be right. all long winded about it. Just yes or no. Do you do it? No elaborate oath. You just say yes or no, right? You say yay or you say nay. 
Now, there's more moral teaching. And, you know, you can think of names you might call this, but verse 38 through 42 is sort of eye for an eye, turn the other cheek. How you treat people. How you treat people. By the way, there's a fantastic passage in early in Helaman where in one verse, I think it's Mormon writing, talks about perverting things, sacred things, smiting people on the cheek, which I think suggests maybe that when we're talking about taking cloaks, turning their cheek, that we're seeing not just a moral teaching, but maybe a moral teaching with ritual actions to communicate it. And then we have uh, love thy enemy. Uh, I, I would call verses 43 to, you know, 47. Uh, maybe that's a separate commandment from the sort of turn the other cheek. And, uh, and then we get to verse 48. And again, I think we're winding up in the first room here. We're winding up with Moses. Uh, and verse 48 says, be ye, be ye therefore perfect. And man, that's, a, that's, a, that's felt so heavy to so many people. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, the reminder, all true journeys are circular. And we started out saying, hey, we're approaching, this is the ordinance by which we approach God. And here's a reminder, even in this room, we have come around and we're talking about, hey, remember what we're doing is approaching our father who is in heaven. But on this, be ye therefore perfect. First of all, the Greek is a future. Not an imperative. It is not an imperative. It does not actually say be perfect. It says you will be perfect. And that is a different thing. I think as Latter-day Saints, I think that's a message we need to hear. We need to hear this message. I, the way I envision it is Jesus says, grab the rod, don't let go. I'm going to get you home. It's going to happen. Yeah. And it's not because we're great. It's because he is. It's, it's his righteousness. That's absolutely right. It's believing in the power of the atonement rather than believing in the power of ourselves to be I can't do sinless. it. I'm helpless. Yeah. I, I just have to grab that rod and hold on tight. Yeah, Absolutely. There is a, there's a second point in here. He says, be therefore perfect. What is perfect? Well, the Greek is teleoi. Tele is the end, the final thing. Teleology is the study of final things. But it can mean other things. Uh, so like tele are your taxes. You pay your, your tele in Greek. But a teleos is, which does, does mean perfect, but it means perfect in a specific sense. It is someone who is ritually perfect, someone who has ritually been completed, is someone who has been through sacred uh, perfecting ordinances. And so that really kind of changes. That be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. Because that suggests you could read this as, hey, you, and then you will be complete. You will be ritually perfected, just like God is. Right. And that, now we're in the space of the King Fallout discord. The, gr the great secret is that God on his throne is a man. And as it's sad that it's a secret because it says it on every page. Because it's right here. But it's a total secret. It's right here. I mean, we're the only ones that believe that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just almost laughable, but it's sad. It sh I shouldn't laugh because yeah, yeah, yeah. it really is sad to think God in heaven is looking at his children and they even have the text and they don't know that he is human that he is their father like yep. and jesus is always calling him my my father and it's just i'm yep. laughing because there's a thin line between tragedy and comedy and it's just so, yeah. so sad that this is a mystery and it's back to that point about initiatic secrets an initiatic secret is not hidden from the world it's published to the world and the world is not ready for it and you only become ready for it one individual at a time what is the likely word in hebrew i have a guess I think the likely word here, there's a couple different words that mean perfect. I think the word here is shalem, which is the same root as shalom, which means peace or mean health, right? In contemporary Hebrew, you know, mashalom cha, what's your, what's your shalom? How are you? Would I, that be like wholeness, like a whole person or complete person? Whole, perfect, or complete, or peaceable. And so it's interesting, there are various passages where, where words like that show up. One of my favorite is Moroni 7.3, which is the last we hear from Mormon. Moroni puts in a, uh, a speech, hey, here's something dad said, Moroni 7.3. And Mormon is speaking and he says, I speak unto those of you who are the peaceable followers of Christ, which again suggests... If, Moroni 7 verse 3. Yeah. Which, again, I think suggests that, that we got a prophet here who is speaking to a mixed audience. 
And so what he goes on to say is interesting, but in that context, but he's, but he says as a key, as a signal to those who are in the know. And now I speak to those of you, a subset of who's here, who are the Shalem followers of Christ. And he talks about, I'm going to read this because I think this is really good. Yeah. I would speak unto you that are of the church that are the peaceable followers of Christ and that have obtained a sufficient hope by which you can enter into the rest of the Lord. From this time henceforth, until ye shall rest with him in heaven, you shall be perfect. Yeah. This is a great verse because there's this path being described. What is this path? Well, it seems to be something that people act out liturgically, but it's more than that, right? It's a roadmap to how to get to heaven and how do you, how do you get the messengers along the way and how do you grow? And I like how he says, who enter into the rest of God now... And then later we'll enter into rest, right? So the path, the rest of God is the kingdom of heaven. You enter in and you rest in the Holy of Holies. And what he's saying is that when we talk about entering into the Holy of Holies, yes, there's a physical thing we can do in physical space. And yes, it's also talking about heaven when we're dead. And also you who are the completed, who are the peaceable followers of Christ, you can enter into that rest and go no more out. The kingdom of heaven can be with you at all times, wherever you go. I think it's also an invitation, regardless of which empire is in charge, you can have the kingdom of God within you, even if Rome is charging you taxes. Yes. In other words, I don't have to wait till I'm dead. 100%. There, man, there's like... Right, this is, I mean, this is section 19, verse 23. You shall have peace in me. I, that, it's the same stuff. Yeah. There's a whole other like hours of conversation we can have. Alma 32 which we commonly say is about faith. And it is, but it's not just about faith. Alma 32, Alma and Amulek have been thrown out by the Zoramites, and they are approached by the poor. And the question that the poor ask them is not, hey, how do we have faith? Oh, we plant a seed. The question is, what shall we do since we have been thrown out of the building? We are not allowed to worship in the building. What shall we do? And the answer... This is my mind exploding. You can't see it, but my mind just went... <laughs> <laughs> the, the the answer starts with faith, but ends in the presence of the tree of life. That's what Alma 32 through 34 talk about. We're yeah. talking about the tree. And it's not just something you do in a building. This is a path that you live. It's a path that, that, that is revelatory. It is a thing you can go, why do we go do these things in brick and mortar? It's to teach us. It's to learn. But that's not what we're actually doing, right? That's in our lives is where we need to be having faith and keeping the covenant and where we will receive messengers from our Father. That seems to be the message there in Alma 32 is yes. you guys can do this in your life. Yes. So, okay, so let me read you another example of this peaceable. i got to put my mind back together while you're looking up your <laughs> The verse. pieces all over yeah. the floor. Uh, D&C 42. And the point I'm making here is when we, is, is I just, I think that the word is shalom. And I think that that word appears as peaceable and as perfect and as whole in lots of contexts that, that are really provocative about temple related things. Uh, D&C 4261, if thou shalt ask, thou shalt receive revelation upon revelation, knowledge upon knowledge, that thou mayest know the mysteries and peaceable things, that which bringeth joy, that which bringeth life eternal. So I think this is Matthew 548. This is a transition, but it's not another commandment. It is the reception. If we're, if we're doing this in physical space, it is a change in status, which is marked by receiving a new title. You are now one of the peaceable followers of Christ. You are one of the perfect ones. You are uh, a shalem. And you are entering into the land of the shalems because we're going to see that the king of the shalems shows up in the next room. So that's Matthew 5. Now, if I haven't got you convinced already, we're going to go on. So Matthew 6, we read them about doing alms. Two things. Uh, one, there's a, alms is actually translating two different words out of the Greek. So it's, it's a little funny that the King James just called it both alms. And one word is elemosune, which is mercy. And the other word is dikaiosune, which is justice. So what we have here in these first four verses of chapter six seems to be a teaching about justice and mercy. Okay, rather than alms, the teaching about justice and mercy. Now, justice and mercy, what do we know about it? Well, verse three, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. It seems to be something that you do with your hands. In verse four, that thine alms may be in secret. 
So I, I think we've got a teaching. There's there's justice and mercy going on here, but I I think it's very as the language is very provocative, and it suggests to me that we have ritual gestures that are being used to communicate ideas of justice and mercy, ideas about being a judge, but also when to grant forgiveness, right? When to give clemency. And then verse four is interesting, that thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And we're going to see again in verse six, thy father which is in secret. Now God starts to show up again, except that God, uh, if these are stage directions, if this is a story in a liturgy, is not yet on the stage. He is in secret and he is watching. So we're getting closer, and God is, if we think of this as three rooms of the temple, God is now on the other side of the veil. In Greek Orthodoxy, I've been to some of their masses, they have this. They have behind the veil the Eucharist, and the priest who represents God will give his chant, and essentially he's telling the people, are you ready to receive the Eucharist? Are you ready to receive? And there is a response, and then there's this dialogue behind the veil, and then they eventually bring it out. And I can't help but think, this stuff's really old, and there's pieces of it everywhere, right? It's yes. kind of what we're seeing here, but it's 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 reflected in other traditions. Oh, I think what you just described is is very much consistent with what we're about to see. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you for that. So that's justice and mercy. God is in secret. Then we get instruction on prayer, and it's very interesting because verses five and and six say, "Hey, thou, when thou prayest, go pray in secret. Let me teach you how you pray. You, Mike. You, Dave. This is how you pray." Thou. Verse 7, but when ye pray, we're now talking about a plural you in the underlying Greek as in in the English translation. When ye pray, don't use vain repetitions. We're being taught how to pray together. Be not like the heathens. And then we're taught what prayer to say. Again, imagining that this is a liturgy, we seem to have a group prayer. Okay. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. This is a reminder. This is where we're going. The kingdom of heaven is what this is all about. We've, we've made it partway there, but the kingdom has not yet arrived. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, this is great. This verse is great because that's not what it means. The Greek says, give us this epiousios bread. Epiusios. Now, epiusios is what we call a, hap, a hapax legomenon, meaning it is a word that only shows up once in the New Testament. Usually, when you want to figure out what a word means in a library, the way to do it is you go around and see how it's used in all the instances. We have it once. Now, epi is a pawn, like your epidermis, right? Uh, usios is something that is existent. It is a participle of the verb to be, something that is existent. Epiusios means something like the one that exists upon or upon the existent one. The King James translators, not insanely, decided that the usios meant the present day. Give us the day we need for the present day, for the existent day. But that's a terrible translation partly for reasons we'll, we'll see, but partly also because what does the name Yahweh mean? Well, we don't know. It's, we're messing with to be, though. Yeah, but it's, hey, we're messing with to be. Yeah, that, that, that verb is being used. I mean, right. whether it's Frank Moore Cross or Christine Hayes, all the Bible scholars right. are like, we are talking about a being who is existing. Who exists. He's, he's doing something. Yep. He is being. Yep. And this is I am that I am. Exodus 3, Moses in the burning bush, right? And even though that's not the verb, it's not the, the, the word Yahweh does not appear, scholars go, this is he's announcing his name Yahweh. So somehow Yahweh means I am the, the one who makes, I am the one who will be, I am the one who always is. Once again, we're back to Joseph Smith, farm boy. Yeah. He gives us the book of Moses. Yeah. Endless is my name. Yeah. I was, yeah. I am, I will be. I mean, he's, he's yep. just a kid when he's putting that out he's there. He's the existent one. Yeah. So I think that the Epiusios bread, now let's just pause this as a hypothesis and see if it makes sense in the rest of the chapter here. <laughs> so Epiusios bread is the Yahweh bread. It's the bread that Yahweh is in or the bread that maybe is on Yahweh. That doesn't, that seems to make less sense. It's the, it's the Yahweh bread. Give us today, give us now. It's urgent. Give us now the Yahweh bread, right? Uh, not give us today the bread we need today. Give us now the we're Yahweh not, We're not talking about focaccia at meters. Right. We're, it's a different bread. And by the way, there's a whole other discourse here about bread. <laughs> Manna is bread. Jesus 
identifies himself as bread in John, as, as the bread of heaven, John chapter 5. He identifies himself as manna. There is bread in the book of Leviticus, the bread of the presence or the bread of the face or the show bread that is baked and apparently eaten. In this second room by Aaron and his sons is what Leviticus says, uh, which, by the way, is flavored with frankincense and is said to be a a memorial offering. And then Jesus in the upper room on the night before the crucifixion passes out for it and says, do this in remembrance of me. There's, there's various connections in the new Testament and old where Jesus connects himself with not just bread, but bread in the temple manna, which was kept Hebrews nine says that a pot of manna was kept inside the ark bread in the temple. Jesus says, I'm that bread. Uh, when he's instituting the sacrament, he seems to be saying, I am the bread of the Levites, which they eat in the temple. Right. So now it's interesting because the prayer here is give us now this Yahweh bread. It reminds me last night I was reading Exodus in the Hebrew and the, I had a student ask me, what's going on with the frost? Why is it compared to frost? Yeah. And the word for frost is a cognate of kafar. Oh, interesting. Well, obviously, because the frost covers the ground. Because right? it covers. But yeah, what is kafar? Atone. It's atonement bread. Yeah. So it's a, it's the same stuff, right? Yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't even uh, I didn't I didn't either. But as that. soon as I looked at, it, I'm like, oh, that's Kafar. They yeah, just yeah. moved the vowel point over. Sometimes you need someone to ask you a question. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Atonement bread, Yahweh bread, Epiusius. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. White. It's white and sweet. It tastes like honey. So we get this group prayer. Then verses 16 through 18, there is this these verses on fasting, and washing and anointing. So. Maybe if we're talking about people who have previously been washed and anointed and have approached in a state of fasting, maybe now they're, it's being explained to them why, right? Or maybe now they're being taught a law of fasting. One of the glories and great challenges is how skeletal this is. And so there's inevitably guessing and inevitably a road of discovering more things over time. It's skeletal, but yet they drop epiusius on you. Right. I mean, that one word is a whole dirt road you could go down. Right. Uh, and there are many such roads. We get, I think, what is the last commandment, the last straight up, you know, covenant here, which is you got to be wholehearted. Okay, hey, it's either your earthly treasures. We're, we're verse nineteen through twenty four, right? It's either the earthly treasures or it's heavenly treasures. It's either God or it's Mammon. There's a reminder of why you're doing this, because it's the eye and light and saying, listen, you have to, to become one of the shiny ones, to become one of the gods living in the city of the gods in the presence of the tree of life. You have to choose that. You do not get to choose other things. Now, By the, way, the treasure is, it's God. It's, it's living the way he lives. That is the treasure that we want. Yeah. Ritually speaking, it's his presence, right? Yeah. And I think it's also provocative that basically they're heading for a space physically, which has a big treasure box in it. Which is the ark. Which is the ark. Which, according to Hebrews, contained the Yahweh bread inside it. We're back to that. Yeah. So I think that's the end of sort of the straight moral teachings. Now we get actions. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body. What yet... Uh, sorry, what ye shall put on is not life more than meat and the body more uh, in the body than raiment. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly father feedeth them. Are they not much better than they? Are you not? Are ye not much better than they? Uh, which of you can, add, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall ye eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. So now, I think these are actions, and I think there's some provocative stuff here. So the actions are that you eat a drink, and you are clothed. And who gives you food and drink and raiment is God. So back to your Orthodox priest behind the veil who calls out, Are you ready? And when the celebrants are ready, he, in the role of God, he represents God, yeah. comes out and delivers the feast. Now, by the way, 
I think the imagery of the birds of the air is not a coincidence. I think that this is one of the reminders that the Elijah priest is the priest of this room who's getting you ready. Elijah is the one who's fed by the birds uh, of the air. Uh, God explicitly provides food and drink. God explicitly provides raiment. Now, I said that when you leave room chapter 5, the first room, you're given a title, and I think it's Shalem. One of the reasons I think that is because what happens now is the Shalem priest, the Shalem king, shows up, and that is the same person as the Lord. He's it's the person who comes down into this land among the Shaloms, and he has the feast with you, with the peaceable ones. Now, what is what am I talking about? What is this, the, the Shalem priest? Well, Melchizedek is a mysterious figure. He's one of these guys who shows up just a very small amount in the Bible, like especially 14, the Old Testament. Genesis 14 is where I'm looking. Yeah. Uh, and then he's like a giant outside the Bible. And there are whole books that, about him. Uh, there's a, a Melchizedek scroll in the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and, and other books of Melchizedek. It's almost like he got written out. It's almost like there was something so important about this guy we couldn't have him there, that he represented the thing that we, the editors, disliked. So, yeah, uh, Genesis 14, I want to say verses 18 to 20. So this is Abraham. He's been battling uh, the five kings, right? Isn't that what happens in the first part of the chapter? Yeah, and then he wins, and he comes back and talks to the king of Sodom, and then finally that interview's over with, and then Melchizedek shows up and brings him the bread and wine. Melchizedek brings him the bread and wine. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, uh, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, uh, etc. Now, Melchizedek, king of Salem. You look in the Bible dictionaries and they'll say different things about what Salem is. Oh, it's an old name for Jerusalem. There's their guesses because they're, they're, they're guessing who Melchizedek is too, regardless of the rightness of those guesses. Because of the way Hebrew is written, this is readable in a different way. Without changing any dots, without changing any punctuation, as it's punctuated in Hebrew, it can straight up read, uh, and Melchizedek, the Shalem king. So Melchizedek, the peaceable king, Melchizedek, and by the way, a war just ended, so like that makes some sense. Melchizedek, a peaceable king, Melchizedek, a perfect king, brought forth a feast of bread and wine for Abraham. I think that story of Melchizedek having a feast with Abraham is a little vignette of this moment in the right. I think you also see in Psalm 23, maybe a little vignette of this same moment where the shepherd who has a staff is showing up and, and is feeding you. He has to go through the valley of the shadow of death, or he has to fight the kings of these five kings of the north, or he has to overcome, overcome the, the trials, the adversary, the it's temptations this. of these four covenants he made, right? Yeah. Now, let me make one other point on this little feast. I'm going to come back and say something about that in a minute. One of the Beatitudes is, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, the name Melchizedek, again, d discussion over exactly what it means, but half of the name is king and half of the name is righteousness. So it means something like my king is righteousness or the king of righteousness or my king is righteous or something like that. I believe that this is the fulfillment in the ordinance of the promise of that beatitude. You hunger and thirst after righteousness, which is Melchizedek, and you are now filled because Melchizedek comes down and gives you a feast of his own flesh and blood because Melchizedek, my king of righteousness, is the Lord. Jesus is that is that king. That we used to call it the priesthood after the order of the Son of God, and then we changed it to Melchizedek because that's not different. Dots are connecting. Now, the chapter ends, interestingly, seek ye the kingdom of God. Okay, again, we have the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added unto you. Now, I think if there are stage directions here, and if righteousness is Melchizedek, so those who are filled with righteousness have eaten Melchizedek, then Melchizedek is now withdrawn. He came and had the feast, and he fed you, and he gave you water, and he, or wine, probably. He clothed you, and he is now gone, and you're instructed to seek him. And where is he? He's in the kingdom of God. 
which lines up very well with the idea that we started in room one of the temple, the porch outside. We've been in room two now, and we're about to approach room three, which is the Holy of Holies. Melchizedek has come down, had the feast, and he's gone back. Now, fast and furious, because I'm already going to be like your longest podcast ever, and I apologize. So look, uh, Matthew chapter 7, we should be entering the kingdom of God here. The first five verses are a warning against judgment. What sense does that make? Well, it makes all the sense in the world that you're about to get your own judgment. This is it, right? You've had your mortal life now. You are about to be judged. So this is your last warning. Get the beam out of your own eye. Six, cast not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Now, again, if you just try and read this as a sermon, it just sounds like random things. Hey, here we go. Here's some paragraphs about uh, judgment, and now, oh, don't holy things before swine. But in the in the context of a liturgy, it makes all the sense in the world because you're about to pass into the into the most holy of these three spheres, the highest, and so you're getting a warning. Hey, this is it. You're going to see it all. Do not tell people who are, you're not authorized to tell. Verses seven, uh, oh, seven through, geez, I don't know, 12 probably. A couple things. You are approaching and you're asking for a gift. What man is there of you whom if his son asks for bread will give him a stone, or if he asks for a fish will give him a serpent? Now, by the way, a couple things. One, you are approaching and asking and saying, hey, I am one of God's children. Will you please give me a gift? There's a longer word we use for gift, usually only in trusts and estates context in the law, and that's endowment. You're approaching your father and you're asking for an endowment. Now, these I will tell you these two verses, I they remain tantalizingly partly revealed to me, okay? I don't mean revealed capital R. Uh, what man of... Is there of you whom if his son ask bread will give him a stone, or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? This is so curious, because there is a stone behind the veil. God is about to give you a stone. And until the days of Hezekiah, there was a serpent, the Nahash behind the veil also. So it's very very provocative. I, I, yeah, I they're, they're definitely messianic symbols. They, they well and and the the Nahash, the Nehushtan, right? The Nahash, the serpent on a is is explicitly a symbol of Christ in the book of Helaman. So, all right, you're, you're approaching, you're one of God's children, you want a gift. But of course, what it starts out with is, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open unto you. Ask, seek and knock is a triple petition. You're knocking on a door and it shall be opened unto you. And who do you expect to be on their side? Is your father, right? That's who you're That's you're who we're seeking. talking about. That's whose house, the kingdom of God, whose door you're knocking at. Verse 13, enter in at the straight gate. That's another code word, right? That's Book of Mormon users are going to use this. It, absolutely. And this is what I was saying about First Nephi 8 earlier, is First Nephi 8 implies a three-part space, and there is a straight and narrow path that goes into the third part, the presence where the tree is located. So here we've got an, a triple petition, ask, seek, and knock, to enter into a straight, i.e. a narrow gate. He says, hey, there's a, the wide gate goes to destruction, but straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. There's like a whole bunch to say here about that. The tree of life, Genesis, Eve, God creates Eve. Uh, I think this is Genesis, end of Genesis 4 maybe, and says to Adam, oh, what, what will you call her? And Adam says in Hebrew, I will call her Hava. For she is the mother of every chai. And it's a pun. And biblical Hebrew is larded with puns. Puns are potent. They show us the spiritual truth. Names matter. She is Hava. She is the mother of every chai, of all the living ones. The Septuagint, the Greek, the old Greek translation, the oldest parts of which probably date back to 300 BC or so. In this chapter, the translators felt the pun was so important that to retain it, they change Eve's name. And so the Septuagint here says, I shall call her Zoe, for she is the mother of all the zonton, of all the living things. Eve is life. 
The tree of life is the tree of Eve. And this is the path that leads unto life, unto the tree of life, unto the kingdom of Eve. Back into the garden, right? So we're going to see some others, but there's a suggestion or two here in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 that the story, the myth that is being acted out. And by myth, I don't mean a false story. No, we're talking about the, an important story. An important story that we participate in by reliving part of it. The myth, that the story that animates this ordinance seems to at least in part to be the story of the garden. And it seems to be about going to the garden. And by the way, there's an architectural, well, let me come back to that in a minute. There's an architectural point here. So what happens? You go through, beware of false prophets. You go through the straight and narrow gate that leadeth unto life. There's a warning about false prophets. You'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Thorns and thistles are akanthi and triboloi. Kanthoi and triboloi. So it turns out those are the same things, Greek translation, the Septuagint, that are said to spring up when Adam and Eve leave the garden. In the Greek, so we're talking about like Genesis 5, I think, right? When Adam and Eve leave the garden, a kanthoi and triboloi spring up. Now, as we're going back into life, the land of Eve. We're leaving the thorns and thistles. We're leaving. It almost as if we are meant to imagine them as a wall. It, this is reverse. This is in Temples of the Ancient World, yeah. that picture where the temple is the reversal of the Eden story. Which is really interesting, right? Because the next thing, we pass through this wall that we, that we had to, we got cast out over the wall and are going back through the wall. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. So that we get through the wall and what we see is the tree with good fruit. And there's a whole other conversation about where is the menorah in the temple. And I will say for now, this, it could be its own podcast. Literally. The prose descriptions in Kings and Chronicles say it's in room two, but the visionary descriptions almost uniformly put it in room three. John puts it in the third room. John puts it at the very end. In fact, let's make, this is really We got to do Revelation 22? Yes. And also we have to do Tolkien. We're going to do both those things right now. And the architecture point. So in the layout of the Jerusalem temple, there are two pillars up front. And according to all the visionary accounts, including this one, a tree in the very back, which suggests that we've got a journey from two trees to one tree, which is the story of Eden, the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil were cast out. And so the story is told cyclically as a circle. Okay. But your experience getting a line and you go from the two trees to the one tree, by the way, the Bible as constructed now, makes that same journey because it starts in Genesis with the two trees, the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And it ends Revelation 22 with just one tree with just one tree, yeah, which is a restored vision of the Holy of Holies. And it's one tree and it's the, by the throne of God. It is in the Holy of Holies and there's water flowing out of it. So the, the flowing waters of the temple that are, that it's interesting. We see them. It's corrupted in, in first Nephi eight and elsewhere are restored to purity. By the way, this is pure tangent. This actually in Tolkien too, because Tolkien starts with the two trees of Valar and the, I think two trees of Arda where the gods are and the spider comes and destroys them. And that's in the Silmarillion in the beginning. And the Lord of the Rings ends after, you know, the rings are destroyed with the tree and Gondor has to be restored. Aragorn, who is the king, goes up into the mountain and gets a living sapling descending from the true tree and goes and restores it. And right. he's wearing it on his breastplate and his shield. That's right, right. Because Tolkien was a profound Catholic and the book Lord of the Rings is deeply Catholic and most people have no idea. Anyway, that's a tangent. So, um, <laughs> but remember, we start at the beginning, right? These nine beatitudes, people with these who hunger, thirst after righteousness, the meek, the poor in spirit, Ashrei, how great their happiness, or of Ashra, they are of Ashra, they belong to the tree of life. Now we've made the journey, and the journey appears to be back over the wall of thorns and thistles and into the garden. I love that connection. Yeah, it's crazy. Verse 21 to 23, not everyone who saith, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, we are, we are now entering the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father. This is it. This is the moment of your judgment. You're passing in. You see the tree. You get your moment of judgment. And therefore, who did their works? And now you get a new title. 
is a wise man and he builds his house upon a rock. I but, never looked at that as a title, but yeah. that, that makes sense because you've sought wisdom Yep. and now wisdom is inside of you. And you are in the kingdom of wisdom. You are in the, in the presence of the tree of life. And read Proverbs three thirteen to 17 in this connection. Asherah, the happiness of the man who finds wisdom, he'll grasp onto her. She'll be a tree of life to him. That's another vignette kind of seeing this, this same thing. So look, building on the rock means you sit upon the throne of God. This is it. You become one of the shiny ones. You become divine. And the storms cannot move you. And so no wonder that verse 28 when Jesus ended these sayings, people were astonished at his doctrine. Those that knew were astonished. Everyone Some people thought, knows. is this just a collection of old Egyptian sayings or right. something? Right. That's Martin Luther it thought that it was a satanic fraud. So look, if you stop listening to the podcast now, you have a key, right? This, this is it. I will tell you that the epistle to Hebrews makes more sense when you realize that the writer assumes that you know this ordinance and assumes you understand the Day of Atonement and is using those to explain who Christ was. And 1 Nephi 8 is showing this same ascent with some interesting details, such as, for example, that you grasp the Word of God four times to pass through the straight and narrow path. And just numerous other passages. So I had to do John this summer in my oh, yeah. class, and I translated it and over and over again, where Jesus says, receive the Holy Ghost, receive me. Oh, yeah. Lumbano. Lumbano is to grasp. Is to, to grasp. Hold. And I can't, I can't let go of the iron rod. I'm grasping it. But then from a ritual standpoint, what does it mean to grasp something and to know someone? And anyway, so John, I think John was in on all this stuff. Oh, 100%. And John won. Right. John one twelve. This is the prologue, and, and John is just kind of giving the overall explanation. And it's very high level and it's imagistic. As many as received him, but it's elabone. It's held him. You're holding as something. many grasped him, to them he gave power, and it's exousia, which means authority. In fact, they actually have a little footnote, authority, right, or privilege. He gave the authority to become the sons of God. Right. In the authority. It's an ordinance. It's an ordinance. Now, let me show you one more thing about that ordinance, okay? And then maybe give you, we'll go through an example and of how. And then we're going to end in 2 Nephi 9. And then 2 Nephi 9. If you've held on this long, and sad to say, there's a lot more than 2 Nephi 9, but at some point, we got to eat. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, that was true of the Book of Mormon always. You always have to leave it at some point. You got to eat. eat. You must eat. So look, let me just read the Beatitudes here. Not the full nine, but just the seven that are, again, there's nine Beatitude statements that matters. Um, not so much for, for Matthew 5 that I know, but for 2 Nephi 9 it matters. But there are seven blessings, right? By the way, it's also provocative that there are seven branches of the menorah. Another reason to think there's a deliberate reference here to the, to the tree of light and life towards which one is journeying. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the same. Verse 3 and verse 9 are the same. So we got, we got seven, seven blessings. See God, inherit the earth, being filled with righteousness, being comforted, being called the children of God, obtaining mercy and receiving the kingdom. Right? Those are the blessings. So it is striking that those blessings, not in this order, but it, these blessings map out against the climax of the ordinance we've been talking about. Because you see God when the curtain parts for the first time and he enters the Haikal. And maybe, by the way, this is when you receive the gift of hope because you think, wow, if God can come down here and I can see the kingdom of God. And we're, there's also kind of the Nicodemus Jesus dialogue here. I can see the kingdom of God. Maybe I can go into it too. You see God. You inherit inherit the earth. God feeds you, but he also clothes you. And there is an account of someone whom God clothes in the book of Genesis, and that's Adam. God clothes Adam and gives him dominion over the earth. You are inheriting the earth when God clothes you. And again, hint here that the story that animates this is the garden story or a version of the garden story in which you return. You are filled with righteousness when God, the Lord Melchizedek, feeds you a feast of his own flesh and blood. Uh, you are comforted by the receipt of the Spirit. 
if you look at the sacrament prayers, the bread and the wine prayers that Moroni gives us in the book of Moroni, he never says where they come from. He never says where we use those prayers. He refers to the church, but he refers to the church as people standing or sitting, and the church did this and that, not a building. Uh, and the, the promise of those prayers is, uh, is that you'll be comforted. And I think that where we should think those came from is this temple liturgy, that those are a version of those were the prayers that the Melchizedek priest spoke as he fed you his flesh and blood, and you were comforted. You approach, you ask, seek, and knock as a child of God. Let me have a gift from my father, right? You're called uh, the children of God. You then have your, after you see the tree, apparently verses 21 to 24, you have your judgment, and this is where you obtain mercy. And then having obtained mercy, you enter the kingdom of heaven, right? So those seven beatitudes are the climax of the ordinance, which I think should suggest to us, if you needed any more convincing, that we're not imagining things. It's almost like a, a list. I, I know that anciently poets were really skilled if they had this huge sermon memorized, but sometimes if they just knew nine things, right, then they could go back, okay, I'm on number two, now we're going to go with this. Now, I don't know how Jesus did this. I don't know if yeah. he had the whole thing memorized, but... It's almost, if I'm hearing you right, like the Beatitudes is a shortened version of this. Nibley writes about this in the Joseph Smith book about the Egyptian endowment where he says they would have an ordinance, but then they had a short list that they would memorize to help them remember the big story. That's probably right. It, and it raises, you're, you're asking a really good question, which is, let me paraphrase, what kind of document is this? Why would you write such a document? Right. Right. And for what purpose is this? For what purpose? And, and you can imagine, um, I can imagine several purposes. Right. One, um, if I wanted to train people to be able to officiate in this ordinance, but I wanted to record it in a way that if someone found it, they wouldn't, it wouldn't make anything of it. They just throw it away or it wouldn't matter. Right. Or they'd say, this is all the devil's work. <laughs> yes. This is a, this is a, this is a counterfeit by yeah. Satan. Good yeah. job, Martin. Uh, <laughs> he didn't like the epistle of James either. The, uh, he was just wrong. Um, <laughs> So another reason I think that I can see writing this down is if you wanted people to be prepared for this experience, right? Think about this ordinance. It's is long. This might have been hours, you know. And in visionary accounts like First Nephi eight, you talk about you know, and then there was a space of time and a power of thir Third Nephi, the passage of time. Like there might have been periods in this ordinance where you were like left alone for an hour to like struggle with your spiritual striving. Right? Let me master myself. I can't. I gotta forgive my brother, you know, Haim, or I can't go to the altar. Right? So I, I think you want people prepared, but at the same time. It's like our temple prep classes. You don't want to say, spell out, okay, here's what's going to happen. Um, I think this is a way to do that. I think this is a way. So you, you teach this text. You say, this was a sermon of Jesus. Let's talk about what it means. Maybe you even subtly sh show them gestures or ritual actions they'll take without them realizing. If they, in the ritual, are going to have, be smitten upon the cheek, and then one reason why I think that might be a ritual gesture is the number of times, the sheer number of times that happens in Scripture, and where your bookworm prophets are on trial or Nephi's on trial, someone smites them on the face. You might mime that, right? You're teaching them, and they think, hey, what are you doing? I don't know. And then, and then they get there, and they go, ah. So I think an instruction manual for teachers, I think an instruction manual for prospective initiates. I think another thing, another reason you write this down is it's a different way to bury the plates. So Moroni, he, he, has, he carries the record. He's alone for years. And the way he transmits it to us is he goes and he builds a stone box and he, he buries the plates. I think the way Matthew transmitted this stuff to us is he wrote it down in documents and circulated it publicly and made sure everyone had it and attached to it all the stories about Jesus everybody loved including other sort of interesting cryptic things. Hey, Mount of Transfiguration. Hey, Temptation in the Wilderness. Hey, uh, which relate to that. And by hiding it in plain sight and just making sure that it was as dispersed as possible, it would survive persecution and it would survive corruption. And if it's coded, then it doesn't get edited. That, yes. No one's going to go, oh, wait, this uh, will take out this part. No, they're just going... Eh, it's more of this weird Jewish gibberish from those guys that, yeah, right? We don't care. <laughs> so let's do Book of Mormon. Okay. Book let's of do Mormon. it. 
let's get into uh, into Jacob. Jacob nine. So Nephi, Nephi, who told us that he's he's writing because he knows the mysteries. Yeah, he inserts. It's actually several chapters, and he doesn't give us any context. He just inserts, here's this stuff from Jacob. And Jacob quotes some chapters of Isaiah, and those are interesting, but I want to go through 2 Nephi 9. So Jacob's speaking, and and the question is, you know, can we, can we, uh, can we infer anything from the text about who he's speaking to or where he might be speaking, and does the text tell us anything that we didn't already know? So ostensibly, he's starting out talking about the covenants of the Lord that he's covenanted with all the house of Israel. But he gets very quickly into a more universal kind of story. So verses 6 and 7, death has passed upon all men. There has to be a power of resurrection, and therefore there has to be an atonement. At the beginning of this speech here, the theme of the fall comes up, which starts to suggest, again, that the garden, and by the way, the whole Book of Mormon is so provocative. One thing that's provocative about it is that the Garden of Eden shows up once in the Old Testament. Maybe again a little bit hinted in Ezekiel, but like it's not super clear. Some references in the New Testament and the Book of Mormon can't get enough. It's all over the Book of Mormon, which is interestingly consistent with our theory that this is a book for initiates whose initiation was acted out in the Garden story, right? So we get the fall, which sets up the drama here. Verse 8, the wisdom of God is praised. That's really interesting, where we think, okay, wisdom is the tree of life. Happy is the man, Ashrei is the man who grabs hold of her. Verses 8 to 9, the adversary shows up. So I'm going, this is very, very fast. Verses 13 to 14 we're talking about the plan of God, and the plan of God is perfection, which doesn't mean that we, we're sinless, that we've successfully lived a sinless life. It's that we, we gain a perfect knowledge. In fact, we gain the perfect knowledge of our guilt. That we're not covered. We need to be covered. We need to be covered with a robe of righteousness. Now, that's really interesting, if, because if righteousness is a stand-in, and I think it is in a lot of these texts like for Melchizedek. Word. Yeah. Then it's a code word. Then we're then you're saying, "Ooh, being covered with the robe of Melchizedek." Verse fifteen: Hey, everyone's got to pass through the first death into life. You pass into life. We saw that in Matthew seven, passing into life, and appear before the judgment seat of the Holy One of Israel. That's exactly the scene there. We're before the throne, right? Uh, we're before the throne, and we're receiving our judgment, uh, and be judged according to the holy judgment of God. So now, verse eighteen: And those who succeed, the righteous, the saints. Inherit the kingdom of God, which was prepared for them from the foundation of the world. So again, it's inheriting the kingdom. It's the, that's exactly the story of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And the throne of God, they're standing at the foundation stone as we conceptualize this verse. We don't even think about that in the West, about the foundation stone. But if, if you and I lived in 650 BC and we said things like gate and foundation stone and the robe of righteousness... Mm. I mean, we just, especially if we were in Lehi's tradition, I think there was a distinction there. There were probably, like you said, different views. But in Lehi's camp, he would have said, we're totally talking temple. Yeah. Let me I mean, come back and throw out some other. Yes, absolutely. So, by the way, read the Psalm of Nephi, the end of 2 Nephi 4. Lehi's dead. And the language Nephi uses to console himself is all this language. God, encircle me about in the robe of your righteousness. Keep me in the right road. I want to go build on the rock. Let me get through the gate. Don't let my enemies assail me. It's this This is what language. we're talking about, yeah. Um, even, I think, more striking, uh, 2 Nephi 2, <laughs> I have it in front of me, when Lehi is exhorting his bad sons, okay, Laman and Lemuel. And, of course, they have their perspective, too. We get various reminders in the Book of Mormon that there's a different side of this story that the Lamanites hand down to their children that we was robbed. Okay, but from Nephi's point of view, the sons who did not obey, the exhortation to them in Second Nephi two is is liturgical. Awake, arise out of the dust. We're talking about Adam, who was created in the dust. Arise out of the dust. Put on the clothing. Come forth out of darkness into light and be men, men being Adam. Again, this language when Nephi is exhorting even his bad sons suggests that they knew this. That one of the reasons why it was a, it's such a tragedy to have lost Laman and Lemuel is because they were initiates. They were shalems. They were perfected. And they fell. 
Which is a warning for all of us. Yeah. And by the way, you know, it's, they, their hearts were set upon the riches of home. Is as, as far as we can tell, basically the problem with them. Or, you know, they wanted to rule. Sort of yeah. the two problems we have with those guys. Yeah. Verse 28. Council. I mean, council. just that word. Count. Okay. So this is like a whole other conversation. And maybe we'll come back and talk about Isaiah 5 and 6 one time. But council, the word in Hebrew is etzah which looks very much like the word etz, which just means tree or piece of wood, but it has an ah on the end, which makes it feminine. So etzah council looks like the tree woman, which again, at this point, your ears should be burning when we say this stuff. So when in verse 28, he's talking about, oh, the cunning plan of the evil one, the, the foolishness of men, when they're learned, they think they're wise and they hearken not to the counsel of God. To be learned is good if they hearken unto the counsels of God. Verse 30, woe unto the rich. Why? Because treasure is their God. They violate the covenant. They worship mammon rather than worshiping God. Now, I completely understand if at this point you're saying, Dave, this kind of feels circumstantial. It's good. But okay, here's where it gets like on fire. So verse 30 to 38, Jacob starts a series of woes. Woe unto the rich, Woe unto the deaf, woe unto the blind, woe unto the uncircumcised, to the, this is my favorite, woe unto the liar, for he shall be thrust down to hell. Uh, woe unto the murderer, woe unto them who uh, commit whoredoms, woe unto those that worship idols, and in fine, woe unto all those who die in their sins. Okay, there was an article back in the sort of 90s when Farms was doing a little more kind of like focused on the Book of Mormon and ancient context kind of stuff, and less of the sorts of things it's doing now. There are two great articles on this chapter that were both just wrong. One of them said, oh, look at this. Jacob is giving a new Ten Commandments. And the article said, there aren't actually ten here. There's just nine. That admittedly is it may be a, a slight miss. But these are like ten new commandments. Well, but here's the thing. There aren't nine commandments. There are ten. But there are nine Beatitudes. And this isn't structured like a commandment. It is structured like the opposite of a Beatitude. Woe unto the liar. For he shall be thrust down to hell. Woe unto the deaf, for they shall perish. So if you are if you are a Shalom, if you are one of the wise, and Jacob is saying this to you, and you hear a recitation of nine with this rhythm, I think what you're hearing is him weaponizing the Beatitudes. And he's saying, Yes, there are blessings, but there are also curses. You shall be thrust down to hell. And he's naming, I think, I mean, I don't know, I think, sins that the listening crowd probably is identifying with. To, to simplify it, with great power comes great responsibility. We're not just blessings. There's warnings if you're going to be entering into sacred space. A hundred percent. And the fact that what, I think that what we're seeing here, it doesn't even look like commandments. It looks like negative beatitudes, which which anyone could hear and be like, yes, woe unto the liar. He should be thrust down to hell. You shouldn't lie. But if someone is used to hearing Beatitudes in a sacred place and in a very positive way, promising blessings, and then hears that same rhythm turned around as a curse and a warning, I think it's infinitely more powerful for that person than for the person who does not have eyes to see and ears to hear. But we're going to get even more detailed. Verse 41 Oh, then, my beloved brethren, come unto the Lord. The way for man is narrow, but it lieth in a straight course before him. And the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. So this, this is straight out of Matthew 7, the straight and narrow gate, and you're meeting with the Holy One of Israel. On the way. On the way. Now, verse 42, whoso knocketh, remember, ask, seek, and knock. Whoso knocketh to him, who he will open. And to the wise and the learned, and they that are rich, and are puffed up because of their learning and their wisdom, yet he despise them, and they'll cast them away. And there's irony there, right? Because we know that the blessing of entering in is to become truly wise. But he's already said, back here in verse 28, to be truly wise requires you to hearken to the counsels of God. These guys don't hearken to the counsels of God, and therefore they are not truly wise, whatever you may think of them, and they'll be cast away. Verse 43, and it's not that he dislikes the uh, the idea of wise here the things of the wise and the prudent shall be hid from there forever he still values wisdom he values true wisdom true wisdom is what is still hidden from them forever it is what remains behind the veil verse 45 
O my beloved brethren, turn away from your sins, shake off the chains of him that would bind you fast, come unto that God who is the rock of your salvation. Verse 50, come everyone and thirsteth, come ye to the waters, come with, buy wine and milk without money, without price. And this is to your point, Mike, and you're saying something very shrewd, is that in some, in some of the accounts, including this one, the feast seems to be in the end. And I think that's what we're seeing here. Where was the rock? You just read Verse it. Verse 45. It went kind of quick. Okay, yeah. So the rock of your salvation, we're eating in verse 50. Yep, it's come unto the rock. Verse 51, we are feasting on that which perisheth not. Because you're not just eating bread, you're eating the Yahweh bread. You're eating the flesh and blood of Melchizedek. The Epiusios. The Epiusios. Right. That's so awesome. That's the new name. It's not my daily bread. The Epi- we got to get the <laughs> Epiusios. The Epiusios. <laughs> So what is this? Well, 53, we become a righteous branch unto the house. We become a tree. This is Isaiah's 11 imagery. Fantastic. We're back to the tree again. So I think that seeing that the Sermon on the Mount, let me remind you that that's not my discovery. It's Jack Welch's. Really, like this should be like when someone goes back and writes the history, they're going to say, man, he saw this thing. And for some reason, it didn't like run like wildfire through the church because we aren't ready for it, maybe right? Because people hear you and I say this stuff and they go, oh, I don't know, it's I, I think nuts. the new books. I think the new books are podcasts as far as this kind of stuff. It's amazing to me how many people say, oh, I just love doing this because I can listen to it and I can think about it. Yeah. Right? I'm more of a book nerd. Yeah, me too. But when I started this podcast, my wife's like, you got to do this. And I said, honey, nobody does that. <laughs> and now I've come to realize, no, people don't read it's, books as much. It's the other way around. But, but, so look, Second Nephi 9. One, I think it makes a lot more sense if you assume that Jacob's audience, at least some of them, have had this experience. They've come under the rock. They've passed the straight and narrow gate. They know what it means to be one of the wise. And they're being reminded that it doesn't mean having a degree, that it means hearkening to the counsels of God. They have received the blessings of the Beatitudes. And so it's powerful for them when those are turned into threats against them. Uh, And they're reminded that, hey, if you want to continue to feast, you need to repent. We don't know what the context is. I think it's provocatively possible that the context is actually in the temple because Nephi doesn't tell us. It's provocatively possible that this is something like a veil sermon. I don't know when, you know, prior to the descent of Melchizedek, Maybe Melchizedek delivers the veil sermon. Maybe you're sitting there and, and, and things are laid out for you. And maybe in this instance, part of the message was, hey, we're doing this today, but you guys really need to straighten up. Here are some ways in which we are falling short. I think there's also, we potentially learn two things about this ordinance from seeing it here in this speech. One is a is a reinforcement. We haven't ever seen a real clear statement. We've seen several indications that the garden story is the story at hand. And again, the fact that we start with the fall and the need for an atonement suggests that here again, the story uh, is the garden story. It's, it's one more it has, sort of... It has to be there, right? Yes. I mean, we've got it. And then we end in God's presence, becoming a righteous branch. We're standing on the rock. We're back in his presence. So this really is a powerful connection. I'm not used to using this phrase. Did you call them the shalems? Oh, yeah, the shalems. The shalems, the peaceable followers of Jesus. <clears throat> those that are whole. Those yep. are in Greek, the telioi, the, the ones yep. that are completed. Yep. And I think that's really what we're all after. Yep. We want to be complete. I want to just thank you for coming out. This has been quite a journey. If you are still listening, you are a champion. And the fascinating thing, we just really looked at one chapter in the Book of Mormon. Right. right? This is not the only place this happens. You you know, you want to have a sort of provocative experience. Just look up every one of the 20 instances of the word mysteries in the Book of Mormon. And just look at what those verses say. One of my favorites is Alma 12, where Alma says, if you're wicked, you forget the mysteries. And it's very poignant because these people from Ammonihah are asking, they're asking questions of Alma and Amulek, and what they are puzzled about is the garden story. And that tells us that, that they once had the mysteries. They've forgotten. And they forgot them. And they can't figure out, well, I don't get it. Why is there an angel stopping people from going back into the garden? The whole Book of Mormon. The so, whole book. So may we be those people that we aren't like the people of Ammonihah. May we repent and stay on the path. That's my prayer for, for all of us. Thanks for listening. 
Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.